My name is Aaron Poston, and uh, my wife and I, we run an organization called Dear Barnett, and we're sponsoring this evening. We want to thank you all for coming. Please give yourself a big hand for coming. I want to actually introduce the moderator, who will then introduce the two panelists. So I'm not going to spend my minute and a half up here speaking about the panelists who have come from very far to speak about the uh, topic for the evening. Uh, quickly, just about you, Bonnet. It's very um, apropos that we are hosting this event, mainly because we are an outreach program, Cure for Chokim, uh, bringing Jews back to their rich and uh, ancient, modern, progressive uh, heritage. And uh, this, this type of event is, is very apropos because we deal mainly with Bale Truva, people who are returning, number one. Many, many people who have, uh, or in search, search for a way of life. We, they call themselves B'nai Noach after we're through with them. And uh, we also help people who are in the process of converting, believe it or not, and their families. We're very much involved. It's a whole, it's a whole, a whole, uh, a wholesome experience. Okay, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, moderator. This is Mayor Sipka Panzer, and he is the main man of the podcast called Holy Madness org. So please keep that in mind, holymadness.org. For those of us who haven't completely lost our minds or faith, and uh, without any further ado, Thank you for that introduction. So, let's get right to our amazing speakers. I'd like to introduce them, but before I do that, let me remind you that when you leave this evening, don't forget about the books that are for sale, and don't forget to unmute your cell phone and to take it off of airplane with it. Okay. Tonight we have with us Rabbi Tuvia Singer, who serves as the rabbi in Jakarta, Indonesia. He is a noted author and the founder and director of Outreach Judaism, an organization dedicated to countering the efforts of evangelical Christian groups who target Jews for conversion. As a renowned public speaker, Rabbi Singer inspired me when I was in 11th grade and inspires audiences worldwide every year. He is the author of the two-volume book, which is available after the debate this evening in the hallway. Let's get biblical. Why doesn't Judaism accept the Christian Messiah? And he is a frequent guest on television and radio shows. Please welcome Rabbi Tobias Singer. And now I would like to introduce you to a gentleman and a scholar all the way here from Great Britain, Carlton McDonald. So, Carlton McDonald is also a published author, and he has devoted his entire adult life to understanding scripture. He is a devoted Christian, and he has come a long way to join us here today, and we're very, very grateful to have you here. Thank you so much. So, without any further ado, let me just remind you again about your cell phones, and welcome Carlton McDonald to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Maybe I need another. Ah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Is that better? It's not on. <laughs> but more people responded. That's pretty good. Good evening, everyone. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Firstly, uh, thank you all for inviting me, an unknown and uncredentialed individual, to come and uh, share. So it's been billed as a debate, but we're not enemies. And indeed, I have been inspired by watching many of uh, Rabbi Tovia's um, broadcasts. However, I'm hoping that we all learn something from both speakers. My 
emphasis throughout my life, as well, throughout my adult life, at the age of 20 I became a Christian and recognized that to be a Christian, I have to understand the Word of God, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. And so what I'm hoping to do is to provide a bridge between both communities, because as believers in a creator, we are unique. As believers in a book that the creator has provided for us, to an extent, uh, one part believes one or two thirds, the other um, part tends to believe a third. I hope to bridge the gap between us. So let's ask the question and hopefully answer it. Is Jesus Yeshua the Messiah? So my journey is uh, an interesting one. I'm going, to I'm going to talk about my journey. I'm going to talk about Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to look at prophecies, both prophecies predicting what the Messiah would do, what the Messiah did, and one of the prophecies that he uh, gave. I will then look at uh, one particular attribute of the Messiah, the light to the Gentiles, and why they had to be a Messiah. Very often we ask, is he a Messiah? Uh, the answer is yes or no. I will also present why they had to be a Messiah. So let's get started. Bible study is the study of the Bible. There are many methods and departments. None is without value. You study the Bible, there is tremendous value to you. Uh, all of them, when done thoroughly rather than superficially, tend to a deepening of conviction as to the accuracy of the scriptures that we have. So my journey, why is it that I can address um, Rabbi Tovia's question, if Daniel chapter 9 is a prophecy of the Messiah, why is it that there's no reference to it in the New Testament? So my journey, about five years ago I was um, studying along with a lot of the people in the uh, church I attend, the book of Haggai. And in my particular Bible, which I've left in my bag somewhere, uh, it says in the introduction to uh, Haggai, and you probably can't see that very well, or maybe it's because Just the right back. Yeah. Uh, in the front part. Thank you very much. So it says in the introduction to Haggai that it was written about 520 BC. And there's a note that says, um, and you can see it just there, it's been several years since Zerubbabel and Joshua led the first return of the exiles to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of God. Introduction to Haggai. Now, I was uh, really quite confused because if 520 BC is after Zerubbabel, then something strange is going on. So I went to the book of Ezra. And in the book of Ezra, again in, in, in my Bible, you can check it later, it says it's written between 457 and 444 BC. Now, 457 BC, if BC uh, begins here, is not, is not, uh, it's so confusing, I can't remember which way around it. So, this one is supposed to be um, after Ezra, but you can see Ezra, according to the notes produced by the biblical scholars, is after uh, Haggai. So, something strange is going on, and I decided, you know something? The only way to understand these biblical chronologies is to go from the beginning. And so, I spent two years going through the genealogies of the Old Testament, starting with Adam and Seth at 130 years. And I produced this enormous chart. That's just a little bit of it. And as I was going through, I discovered some amazing things, one of which is the answer to that question about Daniel 9. So let's look at Daniel 9 prophecy. <laughs> Daniel 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. These are Daniel's people. These are uh, the primary audience, I guess, the, the Jewish people. And upon thy holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see each of these itemized. So I'll jump to 25 because we're going to go back to those. Know, and, uh, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So it starts with 70 weeks in verse 24 and then goes on to Messiah the Prince. So you probably can't see that very well, unfortunately. So on the left hand side, 924, 70 weeks for thy people, for the holy city, to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, 
to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So, thy people. Well, Acts 13, 46. Um, Sha Shaul, Paul, says that since the uh, Jews were taking the uh, message of the Messiah as um, nothing, then they were going to turn to the Gentiles, Acts 13, 46. Uh, the second one, 70 weeks upon the holy city, destroyed the temple. I haven't got a reference for that until the next slide. To finish transgression, uh, Messiah was betrayed, and in Luke 23, verse 4, 13, 23, the transgression, the betrayal of uh, Yeshua, or Jesus, if he's the Messiah, occurred. To make an end of sins, in John 19, verse 30, Christ on the cross declared, it is finished. Five, to make reconciliation for iniquity, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ is our Passover lamb, says Paul. To bring in everlasting righteousness, in Hebrews chapter 8, and uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 16 to 18, we see the new covenant described. And finally, to seal up the vision, no, not finally, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, uh, all fulfilled 490 years after Cyrus' decree. We're going to come back to that in a while. And then to anoint the most holy. We're going to find out what uh, the anointing is, when it took place, and why it's significant. So I didn't talk about destroying the temple. And so I will do that next. <clears throat> okay, destroy the temple. And I'm just going to start on the right-hand side. So there are three references to uh, people saying, this fellow said he was going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Now John, Christ's closest friend while on earth, in chapter 2, verse 18 to 21, uh, says, verse 19, um, that Christ was going to destroy the temple in three days, raise it up again. The response from the Jews, verse 20, then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? And then the answer to which temple was destroyed and rebuilt was in verse uh, 21. Is in verse 21, John 2, verse 21. But he spake not of the sanctuary or the temple, Herod's temple, but the temple of his body. And again, we'll see in a moment why that is so important. There is a prophecy precisely about this temple being rebuilt. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So, in the New Testament, it talks about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Exodus 25, verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Is it the tent or the temple that God wants to dwell in? Or is it in our minds, in our bodies? And so, in John chapter 1, verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, when uh, Yeshua was born and he uh, entered into a human body, 100% man, then the sanctuary, the temple of his body, is indeed that which um, was destroyed or killed on the cross and then raised three days later. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's the question then. Why anointed? Over lunch I asked Rabbi uh, Tovia, as he's a priest, if he was anointed. And he said, well, no, we don't really have um, anointing of priests anymore. But you know, Christ was anointed. So let's have a look at anointing in the Torah. Leviticus chapter 8 and Numbers chapter 8. How do you anoint a priest? With the anointing oil, Leviticus 8 verse 2, Leviticus 8 verse 5, this is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done in terms of anointing 
and priests. And then verse 6 of Leviticus 8, Moses brought Aaron and his sons and Moses washed them with water. In Numbers chapter 8, we get the same um, theme. The Lord spoke unto Moses, take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. And thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them, sprinkle water of purifying upon them. So if a priest in the um, Torah was anointed by being cleansed, by being cleansed with water, by being washed, then it's, <coughs> sorry, it's not just that. That's just one of the things. Thank you for the little uh, murmuring at the end. <coughs> um, so it's important to understand that Christ was also cleansed symbolically. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm going to go off a little bit and then I'm going to come back to where we were. So there is a change of priesthood. And the change of priesthood, according to Paul in the New Testament, is after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. So in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, Melchizedek, brought, uh, king of Salem, brought bread and wine to Abram. And he took the bread in uh, chapter 22 of Luke, gave thanks, break it, gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is, broken, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Uh, verse 20, likewise, after, likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So Melchizedek brought bread and wine to Abram. Jesus, Yeshua, said the bread was his broken body, the wine was his blood. And so there are seven references in the book of Hebrews to uh, Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So According to Paul, the transition from the Levitical priesthood to the priesthood that was earlier than the Levitical priesthood is that of Melchizedek. So who blessed Abraham? Uh, it was Melchizedek without father or mother. But actually, uh, we know, well, I know who the father, uh, I don't know the mother's name, but I know who the mother is of Melchizedek, but that's for another time. So there has been a change of priesthood uh, Jesus, Yeshua, was anointed and he was baptized by John the Baptist. So although John was reluctant to baptize him, Jesus said, you know, it's important that you baptize me uh, to fulfill all righteousness. So he recognized that to become a priest, you had to be ordained or cleansed in order to become a priest. And in that John the Baptist was a uh, a son of Zechariah, of the Levitical priesthood, and his mother Elizabeth was also of the, um, a descendant of Aaron, John the Baptist, anointing Jesus, is effectively passing the priesthood on. Now, I didn't get this uh, for myself. About 27 years ago, a um, Messianic Jew, Dick Rubin, who has a series of videos, uh, shared that, and I have found it uh, really quite interesting. But there's still something more that we need to get to. And that is, we're looking at prophecies being fulfilled. What is the most important prophecy in the Jewish Bible? The raising of the dead after Messiah comes. Okay, that's, um, that's, 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 um, that's, that's, it's certainly a prophecy yeah. and it's certainly very important. But I think there's one that's more important. I'll give you a clue. It's in the book of Jeremiah. Yeah, the New Covenant. You see, the reason why this is so important is what is it that really captures the essence of Judaism? And where did it really start? Was it not the deliverance? Sure, it started with Abraham. But was it not the deliverance from Egypt? And in that, the giving of the Ten Commandments is part of that first covenant. The prophecy was, Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
So not just Jews, Judah, but Israel at large. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. So this is important because that first covenant, which is the covenant that is really what governs um, many of us, is going to be changed slightly. And the change is in verse 33. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward part and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall no more teach every man his neighbor. So it's not that the law is done away with. No way. It is to be written on our hearts. So jumping forward, Romans chapter 2. And uh, Romans chapter 2, 7 uh, to 16. Paul says, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing, so that's something that you do actively, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So Jews and Gentiles are going to be judged in the same way. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So destruction for evil, rewards for good, both Jew and Gentiles. There is no respect of persons with God, for as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. 16. So I've missed out a few verses. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So what have I missed out? This is the essence of the new covenant. Not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles who have not the law do by nature naturally do it, the things contained in the law, these have not the law, the law to themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, their thoughts meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So the change of covenant isn't a change of law, but it's cha changing where it's written. We, when we break one of those Ten Commandments written with the finger of God on stone, should be feeling in our heart that we've done wrong. So let's jump back a bit. One of the um, identifying marks of the Messiah is that he would be a light to the Gentiles. So who, in the Old Testament, is the best example of a godly life? Who is the best person that people in the world should emulate? And thank you very much. Uh, is it Adam? Is it uh, Noah? Is it Abram? Job? Moses? David? Elijah? Daniel? Well, Moses was a murderer. Um, and although he was very, very humble, and uh, he was so righteous that God would speak to him face to face, he, that, that, that murder is not a good example to follow. I would... Whoa. Okay. Um, well, question time. Don't write it down. We'll answer that later. We have, okay, well, make sure you ask that question later. So, uh, I would really like to know, and I'd like to hear, um, what flaw you find in Jesus. Now, he makes claims that uh, you will perhaps disagree with, but seems to be a perfect example. So, what does Yeshua, what does Jesus represent? John 4, 22. He says, salvation is of the Jews. Do you disagree with that? So, this person that... Um, you're not accepting as the Messiah says, salvation is of the Jews. To us who believe in the New Testament, it's saying, you want to understand the real merits of um, keeping the commandments, of doing good. You need to understand and study the life of the Jews who are living that out, or at least ought to be living it out. So this anointed one, anointed by John the Baptist, says to the whole of Christendom, and you'll see in a moment, much further than that, salvation is of the Jews. And if a Christian believes the Bible, they should read the Bible. When they see that, they should, oh, 
I need to understand the Jews. Why is this Jewish person saying salvation to the Jews and yet many of the people that we hear from the front seem not to agree? You know, I was in Laodicea this year. I was in Laodicea in 1992. I wanted to visit all the churches in the book of Revelation, seven churches. Couldn't mm. find Laodicea anywhere. Went back to Turkey this year and we've got Google and um, sat now. I've managed to find Laodicea. Look at this. It's the reason why Christians don't recognize the importance of the Jews. Look at this. So, in Laodicea, in Turkey, it's not far from um, Colossae, there is a couch of Laodicea, and there is one of the 49 canons. Don't know if you can see it. Canon number 29. A Christian, a Christian shall not stop work on the Sabbath, but on the Lord's day. And by this, they mean the first day of the week. Why is this so important? While Jews walk the earth, we have an enemy, a spiritual enemy called the devil. He hates the people that show we are created. When I first um, met a Jew, it was so warming because growing up in the middle of England, you don't see uh, many Jews. And so meeting a Jew, I knew I read about it in the Bible. Here is someone who is a descendant of the people that I'm reading about. When I went to my, the, the synagogue for the first time, it gave me a sense of, again, connection with the Creator. You are the visible, you Jews are the visible evidence that the creation in uh, Genesis is true. Unfortunately, Laodicea, for the, the Christians, is a representation of the church, the Christian church, at the end of time. And having gone to Turkey and gone to Laodicea and seen that it was at Laodicea, they decided, you know something? Do not um, rest on Sabbath, rest on the Lord's Day. Major problem. But I'm going to get on to the, um, the Daniel 9 thing. Daniel 9, fulfilled. The timing of the prophecy, all the prophecies of the Bible are true. Amen. One of the reasons I am a Christian is because more than 2,000 prophecies of the Bible, every single one of them true. Scientists go out to try and disprove something and they can't find it uh, and they end up becoming Christians. Every single prophecy comes true. So, 490 years. There is a reference to it in the New Testament. But first, we've got to go back to Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, Daniel is studying the book of Jeremiah, where the 70 weeks would come to an end. And so you can see the 70 weeks in red there. And in verse 24, we saw 70 weeks are determined unto thy people. So the 70 weeks are 490 years. So we have to try and find the 490 years in the New Testament. And for that, I'm going to go to Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, pretty good at counting. Uh, and he talks in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 1 about 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to uh, the captivity in Babylon, 14 generations from captivity to uh, Jesus. And there was a question asked about, uh, did the New Testament writers... Uh, right to try to persuade people. Um, verse 13 of Matthew 13, 13 and 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables. This is Matthew quoting Jesus. I speak to them in parables because seeing they see not and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Daniel chapter 12 verse 4, Seal up the book until the time of the end. So there are things that are in Scripture that are sealed until the end of time. So are they trying to persuade or are things written in such a way that today we are going to see the connection between that 490 years in the Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah and in the New Testament. So having gone through the Bible and gone through all the genealogies and counted the number of generations from David, from David to the captivity, there are actually 17 of them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 to the captivity. So when Matthew says 14, he means something else. So 14 generations. What is a generation? The Bible speaks for itself. So let's go to the Old Testament, see what a generation is. 
Numbers 32, 13. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness. How long? 40 years. Until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. Psalm 95, verse 10. 40 years long was I grieved with this generation. So a generation is 40 years. The Bible is absolutely fantastic. So, no, let's go back. So, uh, 14 times 40 is 560. 214 is 28. 228 is 56. Add a zero, uh, 560. So, 560 years is 14 generations. Now, isn't it interesting that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2 mentions 70 years of captivity. Verse 24 mentions 70 weeks determined unto the people, anointing the Messiah, destroying the temple. 70 plus 490 is 560. So, we have one generation is 40 years, 14 generations, 560 years, exactly the same period of time as the 70 years plus 70 weeks. You know what that means? It means that the 560 year period is the period that coincides with Matthew's 14 generations from the captivity to Jesus. Now, is Matthew doing this so that you can understand it? Is he trying to persuade you? Or is God writing it so that if we search, we will find and see that that prophecy is fulfilled at the time of Christ? I've got two minutes. Two minutes. Three. Okay, thank you. So when did it start? 70 weeks are determined. Um, know that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, this is to um, Cyrus. There's a prophecy in Isaiah 45 verse 1. To the anointed Cyrus, who will subdue nations and the gates shall not be shut. He fulfills that prophecy 150 years later in Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, he made a declaration that... Um, ooh, the, but, the, so, the so, first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. So Daniel says, sorry, the angel in Daniel 9 says, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, 70 weeks. Cyrus says, in fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah, 70 years, um, the Lord stirred up the spirit of, of Cyrus and he said to the Jews, you can return back to uh, Jerusalem. So the 70 years of Jeremiah in Daniel and in Ezra and in Chronicles 30, 2 Chronicles 36 are 70 years and the, the declaration Jews can return is the beginning of the uh, 490 years to the Messiah. So the end of Jeremiah's prophecy is the beginning of the 70 week prophecy and it means that Messiah must be anointed sometime during those or yeah, by the end of the 490 years after Cyrus's decree. The Messiah must be anointed, other, otherwise the prophecy is not true. And we know that all the Bible prophecies are true. If you want to understand prophecy, you must first understand history. So let's have a look at some prophecies about Christ. Um, so, Isaiah 7.14, A maiden shall conceive, uh, bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. Uh, the, the angel that visited Elizabeth, Zachariah's wife, uh, prophesied of John that John would be great in the sight of the Lord. Verse 16, many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the, the Lord their God. And he will uh, go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. Gabriel, when he came to, according to Luke, a virgin, and the angel came in unto her, and then uh, Luke chapter 1 Verse 31, the angel said to her, you shall call his name Jesus, one, he shall be great too, he shall be called the son of the highest, the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, if this is all made up, how could someone make this up nearly 2,000 years ago and it be so true today? Is Christ's kingdom any um, smaller? How could such um, a fraudulent events have so much weight. I need to go to my last 
uh, yeah, but I've got one minute left. So, um, the, there's a prophecy that Christ made in Luke 21, and uh, I'll just go straight to verse 24. Luke 21, 24, it says, They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. Written nearly 2,000 years ago. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. President Trump, 6th of December last year, contributed to fulfilling this prophecy of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. How could, well, uh, you must at least admit he's a prophet, to be making such an accurate prediction. 200 years ago, there were no Jews uh, in control of Israel. That prophecy has come true. It is made by Jesus Christ, who says salvation is of the Jews. I uh, have much more to go into. I'll have to save some of that till later. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Carlton. And now, we can welcome the singer to the Bruchem Haboem, welcome. I um, should begin by saying that when I was a young man, I never imagined that I'd be standing on a stage with a Christian debating whether Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah. In fact, when I was a young man, I never imagined that I would be interested in helping people around the world who are in the church to return back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm very grateful that I Kodesh Baruch that the Holy One, blessed be His name, allowed this to happen. And as I got a little bit older, I began to to meet many, many, many Christians, very fine people, and I realized that, in fact, people needed to understand about Scripture, because as it turns out, Carlton, I, I thank you very much for joining us here tonight. He has an opinion about the Messiah, about God's salvation program for mankind, I know there are rabbis, they have an opinion too. <laughs> but we are not here to find out about the opinions of men. We are much more interested in finding out what is God's opinion? What does God think about this? I mean, after all, that's what matters. Now, how would you know? How would you know what God's opinion is about the Mashiach? Where do we look this up? How will we find it? There is only one source, and that's Scripture, Tanakh. It is that Scripture that has been given to the prophets of Israel and has preserved us to this day. And therefore, we will only seek to use our holy writings of Scripture to understand what does the Bible teach? What is Hashem's promise? As I mentioned, I was born 15 years after the Holocaust concluded. I, I grew up thinking that in, in Brooklyn, it's hard to tell from my British accent that it's true. <laughs> you can't tell I know you thought. From Ireland, you thought, not true. When I grew up in Borough Park, Brooklyn, I grew up with folks who were survived Auschwitz, had numbers on their arms, and I grew up around a highly gentrified area of people who are definitely not Jewish and certainly did not like me. And I didn't care about them very much. But as I mentioned, it would be years later that I would find out two things. I used to think that Christianity was simply a mistaken religion. They were wrong about certain very important items, but it was something like Buddhism and some religion out there, and they just sort of misconstrued what's going on. They misapprehended it. But I thought that Goyim, the nations of the world, they were terrible people. In my early 20s, I discovered something fascinating. And that is, the non-Jews I was meeting, these people were very, very fine people. 
and that Christianity was in fact much more horrific than I ever imagined. What does Tanakh tell us? What does the Bible tell us about Mashiach? What does scripture say? Does the Jewish scriptures ever tell us that the Mashiach is supposed to die for our sins? It's not there. This is what my Bible says, that when the Mashiach comes, events will unfold before our eyes. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers sea, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. Did that happen 2,000 years ago? That was not what unfolded. In fact, it was because of the destruction of Yerushalayim, and it was because of the exile that the knowledge of God diminished, was not increased around the world. Carlton mentioned earlier that we have to thank Christianity, not his words, for spreading the light. What would the Jewish people do without the church? How would we ever have survived? I want to give my great thank you to the church, and I want to thank you, because without you, I don't know how we would have ever made it. Thank you for protecting us, that we survived. I don't know how we would ever make it. I'm going to go to the church and all these sepulcher. After, I'm going to say thank you so much for thanking for taking care of us all these years. What a glorious church that is. Without the church, we would never have survived. Thank you, Christianity. What a bracha, what a blessing. What a fantastic institution. Has there been an institution in history that has murdered more Jews than the church? The product of Jesus and the product of the teachings of the New Testament. Has there been a teaching that has taught the, taught the people of the world to curse Israel? I've got a Bible that says Zephaniah, Chapter 3, verse the, chapter 3, that in fact, that in those days, all the nations will speak of a pure speech. They will not be cursing the Jews. They will not be saying that the Jews are the seed of the devil. They will not be seeing, they will not express the screed uh, that we find in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 16, even as they are the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets and are contrary to mankind. The church fathers probably, people like Augustine, or well, Melito, we have his screed, he's an earlier church father. Luther, Calvin, our good friends. They probably would have been fine people if they had never been exposed to Christianity. It's unfortunate that these folks, that, that, that Irenaeus, it's a shame that Eusebius was exposed to the teachings of the church because he expressed ideas that were so offensive to our people. On that day, God's he will be one and God's they will be one. Well, that's not the case today. My Carlton MacDonald mentioned earlier that Jeremiah 31 is fulfilled in Jesus. Jeremiah 31 tells us that days are coming that God will make a covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. That means the northern kingdom and southern kingdom are going to be restored as is prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 37. It tells us in those days, uh, which Carlton believes it was fulfilled 2,000 years ago in Jesus, that no one will have to teach anyone about God because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. That didn't happen either. We were told about a prophecy in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 21. We find similar texts in Matthew 24 and so on that Jesus prophesied that the temple would be destroyed, that Jerusalem would be destroyed, and the children of Israel would be murdered and exiled from the land of Israel. This is a fantastic prophecy. The book of Luke was probably written somewhere about 80, 85. That would be like me telling you that David Koresh, who died years ago, prophesied about 9-11. In, in the year 80 or 85, when the book of Luke is written, it's telling us that Jesus said that the temple would be destroyed. Where is that prophecy? Where is prophecy in that? And then eventually you will see the glory of God coming, that the Son of Man will come with the clouds of heaven. And then in verse 32, Jesus, we are told, says that this generation will not pass until these events unfold. Well, it did pass and nothing happened. The Messiah didn't come. 
It is precisely the, the antithesis of what the Messiah is supposed to do. In fact, what we heard outlines precisely why Judaism does not accept the Christian Messiah. There can be no period in history when we see the very reciprocal of what the Messiah is supposed to accomplish. As we in view, for example, the temple is supposed to be destroyed. This is what the Messiah is supposed to do? Predict the destruction of the temple? Or are we told in Ezekiel chapter 37 that in fact there'll be a prince and there'll be David, my servant. That's the Messiah. All Christians and Jews know that. And the Jews will keep the, to will keep the commandments. And they'll, my sanctuary will be in your midst. And then the nations will know that I am Lord. Well, in the first century, no temple was built, but one was destroyed in the year 70. We have, I have a Bible that says in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 6, that I'm going to gather you in and I will bring you back. And I'm going to say to the north, give back. And the south, hold not back my daughters. I will bring you back from the ends of the earth. There are many of you sitting here today that God found you and brought you home. He kept his promise. Because the glory of Israel, HaKadosh Baruch never lies. Why? Ki lai adam hu. Because he's not a man, he not him, he'll never change his mind. And Baruch Hashem, here we are in Yushalayim. And he didn't change his mind. Baruch Hashem, we are here. These are, the, these are the prophecies that are outlined in Scripture. There's not going to be what Matthew tells us, where Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. Think not that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring war. To set a son against his father, a daughter against a mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law that a person's enemies will be them of their own household. What kind of prophecy is that? What kind of Mashiach is that? And if that's your kind of Mashiach, I want nothing to do with him. That is precisely what Malachi says will not happen. The very last prophet of Tanakh tells us that when Mashiach comes at the end of days, the families will be restored and returned back to the God of Israel. Not death is described in Luke chapter 21, but the resurrection of the dead. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. There are many who lie on the earth that will rise to everlasting life and others to everlasting contempt and damnation. Read the book of Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Sheikh Neafar, those who lie on the earth, but are only Shechenim. They're only there temporary. They're going to be brought back from the grave. That's a promise, and that did not happen in the time of Jesus. We could be sure there's no relationship between Jesus and what the Tanakh teaches about Scripture. Tanakh tells us what the Messiah is supposed to do. We have texts in Isaiah chapter 2 where we are told that the Mashiach, Veshafat bein Agayim, he'll judge among the nations, Rabim, and he is going to teach many, many nations. And what are they going to do? They're going to take their swords and their spears and turn them into plowshares and pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither will they learn of war anymore. That's what the Messiah is supposed to do. Not tell us that the, that the temple is going to be destroyed. Not tell us about destruction of family unity. But the world is going to come back together. We have, we have texts in Isaiah chapter 11. And I know Carlton believes that these texts are talking about the Messiah. That in fact, Jesse is the root. And the Messiah is the branch. And what is he going to be? He's going to be filled with the fear of Hashem, fear of Hashem. Well, how could the Messiah be God if he's going to fear God? This is completely antithetical to the teachings of the Jewish scriptures. I wanted to address Daniel 9. Just the context. Daniel chapter 9, a chapter of... 27 passages begins by telling us that Daniel was contemplating the prophecies of Jeremiah, the word of Jeremiah. Pay attention to the word Dvar. And he was having trouble. He tells us that it is in the first year of Darius the Mede. This is critical. Well, people will read it and they go, what does that have to do with anything? And he was contemplating the prophecies of Jeremiah. 
Well, if it's Darius the Mede, who is now the leader, and that means the Babylonian Empire has collapsed. And the Persian Empire, the, the media Persian Empire has now emerged. Daniel is looking at two prophecies in Tanakh, specifically in the book of Jeremiah. One is Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 12. And the other is chapter 29, verse 10. And they both speak of 70 years, not 70 weeks. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10 specifically says that the Jewish people will return back to this land according to the word. And Daniel is looking around, and he's perplexed, and he's shocked, and his heart is filled with fear. Why? Because the Babylonian Empire has in fact collapsed, meaning that Jeremiah chapter 25 has been fulfilled. But nothing's happening. The Baishlam, we're in Golos. There is not even a hint of any return of the Jewish people. And he's petrified. He is terrified because what happens if the part of Jeremiah, of Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 12 has been fulfilled, but 29, God forbid, has not been fulfilled? And what is, what is Daniel contemplating? What is his worst fear? We know it from reading Daniel 9. His worst fear is that the punishment outlined in the Teicha of Leviticus chapter 26 verse 18 is that if you continue to sin, I will multiply your punishment seven times which means it's not going to be a 70-year exile. God forbid it could be a 490-year exile, seven times 70. And as he's praying, the angel Gabriel, the angel is sent to Daniel. And he outlines him a unique part of history. The history from the destruction of the first temple until the destruction of the second temple. The second temple stood for 420 years. The Babylonian exile is 70 years. And that's why it's describing the destruction of Bayashani, the second temple. If that anointed one is Jesus, he missed it by 40 years. Oops. The text says specifically that 70 weeks have been decreed upon your people, that six things would occur. Among them is the end of sin. The end of sin. Did the church bring about the end of sin? Did Christians bring about the end of sin? Did Jesus bring about the end of sin? Has sin ended? It did not. The prophecy then continues. The say of Saskel min Dover. Know and understand that from the going forth, it's not the devour doesn't mean command. What does the word devour mean? The word, the going forth of the word. There's no word command here. What word is he talking about? It's the word of Hashem. It's the word of Jeremiah that's only found in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. What kind of word is this referring to? What the angel wants us to know for sure. Lahashiv the Livnais Yushlayim. We're talking about the rebuilding of Yushlayim. Ad Mashiach Nagid. Until an anointed, um, an anointed prince. How long would that be? Shavuim Shiva, seven, seven weeks. That means from the time, and we can go back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, from the time of the going forth of the word, regarding from the destruction of the temple, until an anointed one comes, and he is the one who gives the order to go back and rebuild your Shalayim. That will be seven weeks. That's how long? A week is, a week is, is seven years. Seven weeks is 49 years. Who arises a half a century after the destruction of the first temple? One person. His name is Cyrus. And it says in Isaiah 45, verse 1, that Kairos, he is my Mashiach, he is my anointed one. He is going to give the command to go back to Yerushalayim and to restore Jerusalem and to build the temple. In fact, Isaiah 45 then is almost devoted to, don't question me, why would you use someone like Cyrus? Don't question me, why would you use someone who does, not, who does not know my name. It's a part of God's plan. Now, what the church has done, it seeks to, missionaries tell us that we have in Daniel chapter 9, we have the precise length, the precise time of exactly when the crucifixion would take place. But what they do is they conflate seven weeks and 62 weeks. 
I'm going to read it to you over here. Belivne Shishlam Mashiach Nugget, Shvuim Shiva, seven weeks. Period. There's an esnak there, there's a stop. And then, for, and then for Shishim Ushnaim, and then for 62 weeks, 434 years, Tasha Venivnesa, you'll re be returned and it'll be rebuilt. Rechai Vacharutz, street and moat, but, but in trouble times. And what the church did was it took the seven weeks. And then it took 62 weeks, inflated them as though there's one anointed one spoken here, and if there isn't, there are two. In fact, this happened in hundreds of years ago because the original King James 1611 has a semicolon there, and in 1769 it was taken out and conflated. I've asked the question in many times, and that is if we find clearly in Daniel 9, as Christian missionaries tell us all the time, an exact prediction of when there's going to be a crucifixion. If that's the case, why isn't there one writer in the Christian Bible that mentions this? Do you really think Paul went, yeah, not important enough? Does anyone truly believe that Matthew would ever, would ever go, yeah, there is a prediction, but it's not there? The answer is they didn't, they didn't come up with it. They didn't invent this before. In fact, the first person to ever mention this so-called prophecy about Jesus was the Archbishop of, uh, he was in France at the time, um, in 180. That's our earliest time. You're telling me that Justin never thought about it? The author of Dedicate never thought this was interesting enough? That Clement of Rome, these are very early books. They're often called Apostolic Fathers. They just didn't think this was important enough. And if you're not sure what I'm telling you is correct, read the next passage. Verse 26, After the 62 weeks, it doesn't say the 62 and 7, an anointed one will be cut off. You know what the King James does? It, puts a, it says the word Messiah, it puts a capital M there, and puts a definite article that doesn't exist. There isn't any such thing as a capital letter in the Hebrew language. In fact, I, I brought with me, this is in fact Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 and 25 from the original King James 1611. It has gone under numerous revisions over the years, which is fine. The language is updated, but this was changed. Here you can see in verse 25 that the semicolon is there. They knew it and someone changed it after. How do you change the word of God? And if you're going to change my Bible, you think I want anything to do with you? Do you think I want anything to do with, with these kinds of teachings? And then we are dis then what comes into view is the last week. That last week from the end of the, the war of the Armenian succession from 63 to 70. That last week is divided in half. They make a covenant. A covenant is made with the great ones, but something happens in a half a week. And I want Carl to tell us what that is. I'll tell you exactly what happened in 66. In 66, there was destruction. There was a war. A war, a war that was raged right where we are right now. Mashiach is removed, meaning an anointed one is removed. The word Mashiach appears, 20, appears 13 to 39 times in Tanakh. It is never referring to who we call the Mashiach today. That doesn't mean the Mashiach is not anointed. Was the temple, in fact, destroyed? It was in 70. And that works out perfectly. I would like to know what temple was destroyed in the year 30. We know exactly when the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. We know exactly what happened in 66. We have a precise prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Carlton discussed Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31 says that, in fact, thus saith the Lord, God is speaking here both to the house of Israel and Judah, to both, because it, it is in the Messianic age. That I'll make a new covenant with you, not like the old covenant I made with you when it took you out of Egypt. And it says, and he quoted it correctly, 
Although I was a husband to you, you rejected me. The author of Hebrews, whoever he was, didn't like those words. And the author of Hebrews in chapter 8 changed those words to say, although I rejected you. How do you change a husband to you to I rejected you? What is the purpose? Why does Hebrews do this? Because of the last passage in Hebrews chapter 8. Because what is old waxeth away and then disappears. How do you change the word of God? How do you alter it? And if you're going to play with my Bible, if you're going to tamper it, you think I'm going to convert to Christianity? You think I'm going to join this movement? How, why would I turn my back on the God of Israel when the text misquotes our scripture? Carlton discussed about the prophecy of Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew 1, 23, we are told that Jesus is born with one of two infancy narratives found in the New Testament, one of Matthew and Luke, and that Jesus was born of a virgin. He was conceived as such. Matthew wants us to know that this is not an arbitrary event that the Messiah is, was conceived miraculously. I want you to know it's a fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. It was foretold in your Old Testament, young man, that the Messiah would be conceived to a virgin. And it quotes Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Hine ho almo horo. Behold what? I think I heard the word maiden. So maiden is a word that I don't think we use very much conventionally, do we? But a maiden implies that it's like a maiden voyage. What does that mean? A first, a first voyage. But Matthew says, Behold, a young woman is with child, and she'll bear a son, and calls his name Emmanuel. As it turns out, the word virgin is not in the text. The word maiden isn't in the text. That word is the young woman. Ho almo means the young woman. It's not a word that we find very often in Tanakh. It's found nine times. And in fact, in, in Proverbs chapter 31, what's Proverbs chapter 31 about? It's about a woman of valor, a very unique woman. We sing about her every Friday night. Well, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 19 and 20, tells us about a woman who's not such a nation's chayo. She's in fact a, a the king, this is the way of a giver with an alma. Such is the way of an adulterous woman who commits a sin, wipes her mouth, and says, I've done nothing wrong. That is quite a virgin. The word elem is used in Tanakh twice. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 56, and 20, verse 22. And who is the elem? That's the masculine version of Alma. That's David. Was David also a virgin? And if he was a virgin somehow... Why does not the King James translate the word Elam as a virgin in 1 Samuel 17, verse 56, and 20, verse 22? I'll tell you exactly why. Because there's no theological benefit from changing. Besides this absurdity, there's no theological benefit for doing that. So he's called a lad or a stripling or some kind of word that means nothing. Moreover, Isaiah chapter 7 has nothing to do with the coming of the Mashiach. Isaiah chapter 7 is describing a civil war. Ahaz was the king. The nation was trembling because the northern kingdom had conspired together with, with Syria, not us, Syria. And they were now going to go to war. They wanted to destroy Yushalayim. They wanted to destroy Ahaz. They wanted to destroy the house of David. Ahaz was a very wicked king, one of the worst of all. But Hashem had a promise. And the promise is that nothing could happen to Malchus David Nothing could happen to the Davidic kingdom. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. It is impossible. And therefore, Yeshayo Anovi came to meet Achaz. He came with, the, he, there was a boy there. He came with his son. His name is Shari Yashuv. The remnant will remain in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3. Why would he come with Shari Yashuv? Why would the Bible mention this? Because Shari Yashuv means the remnant will return. All these names that we find in Tanakh, given to the prophets are signs to the, to the children of Israel. Read Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. And the verse that follows Isaiah chapter 7, 14 is, cream and honey will the child eat when he knows to reject bed and choose good. 
For before he knows through Jack, Jack Bad and choose good, these two kings will be destroyed. Explain to us how this could be possibly referring to Jesus. The answer is that Matthew had changed our Jewish scriptures in order to make them appear Christological. And I'm going to say to you something that is very odd. And that is, it could be said, it could be said that there was possibly no person in human history that was more responsible for the rejection of Jesus on behalf of the Jewish people than the author of the book of Matthew. Had the book of the author of Matthew have never written, and that book had never been seen, possibly many, many Jewish people might have chasvisham converted to Christianity. But Matthew, because of these fulfillment citations, that are all fake, the Jewish people have to say, this has nothing to do with the word of God. Because that Kodesh Baruch Hu keeps his promise. He never changes his mind. God is not a man that will change his mind. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. So it's in fact, as it turns out, that Matthew, Utsu eats a Vesuva. Let them come up with a plan. Vesuva, it'll fail. Dabru Dava, let him talk. Beloyokum, it will not be accomplished. Why? And here's our key word. Ki Emmanuel, there's Emmanuel. It doesn't mean God is with us. It means that Kodesh Baruch is watching over us. He's keeping us, and he has kept his promise. And here we are in Yishlaim, and the God of Israel has never broken his word to call Yisrael. And we hear Baruch Hashem, and God has preserved specifically those Jews who have rejected the teachings of the church, and those Jews who embrace the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you very much, Rabbi Singer. And we now invite up Carlton again for 15 minutes. Oh, uh, Rabbi um, Tovia spoke about Christians killing Jews. And it's true. Um, I'm not proud about it. But you know, the same Christian church killed, they say, between 50 to 80 million Christians. If someone says, I believe the Bible is the sole basis for our faith, they'd be burned at the stake. So, yes, it, it's, it's great um, sound bites say the Christians killed the Jews. They killed Bible-believing Christians. There is a eight-volume set called Foxy's Book of Martyrs. I live in Birmingham where the original of those stories of the martyrs uh, have existed. So it's not just Jews that have been killed by uh, Christians. And so don't reject the Christian um, view of the scriptures because one sect, um, and in fact Martin Luther, changed from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, started the um, Reformation, but still hated Jews. He was still steeped in error. So please don't reject the New Testament just because... Um, unfortunately, uh, Jews have been killed by them. <laughs> uh, oh man, what's going on? Escape. Okay, whoops. Okay, so uh, Rabbi also mentioned that um, the transformation of the world didn't happen in or by uh, AD 34. <clears throat> you know, so I've, I've looked at um, Islam a little bit, and this is what the Quran says. Uh, in, uh, it, it says, this is a book that we've revealed, and this is um, supposedly Allah uh, saying, I've revealed this book, follow it, guard against it. Um, verse 156 of um, chapter 6, or Surah 6, Ayah 156, lest you say the book was only revealed to two parties before, that's the Jews and the Christians. So Muslims are taught that Allah gave holy books to the Jews and the Christians. They read about it, and in um, chapter 3, verses 45 to 50, speaking about Isa, uh, or Jesus, uh, he speaks in the cradle as a baby, this is according to the um, Quran, not that I agree with this, he makes a bird by permission of Allah, uh, and it goes on to say, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, therefore be careful of your duty to Allah and obey me. So Muslims are to obey Isa. So just like Christians are to read and study um, Jews and Judaism, 
John um, 4.22, uh, Muslims are to also read the Bible and obey Jesus. It's not going to happen straight away. This is taking place over time. I went to um, Kenya last year and did some charity work with a group of Sikhs and so looked into their holy book, uh, the Siri Guru Granth Sahib, page 1083, practice within your heart, the message to Sikhs, practice within your heart the teachings of the Quran and the Bible. So a Sikh is to practice the teachings of the Bible. <clears throat> the, uh, page 1350, do not say the Vedas, the Bible, the Quran are false. Those who do not contemplate them are false. So a Sikh is to read these documents, contemplate them, and make up their own mind. And so I have a friend I went to university with, and he's constantly talking about Jesus and the Lord's Prayer. And he's learning from Jesus. The world is learning about Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm a little confused. Daniel knows the 70 years of captivity have come to an end and Gabriel says 70 weeks and it's as if you're ignoring the first um, 49 years and yet those 70 years have gone so how is a 70 week prophecy a 490 year prophecy how are you cutting off the first few weeks um, leading up to the building of the, the, the temple I don't understand um, we might have to discuss this afterwards now, you say that Cyrus came 40, how many years? After, 49 years after the um, Babylonian Empire came to an end. But my understanding is um, they were, so Darius and Cyrus were co-regents. And in fact, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 1, it says that Daniel lived until the first year of Cyrus. So is Daniel... 70 years of captivity, plus the 49 years up to Cyrus, according to Daniel chapter 10, plus he was 16, maybe 18 years of age. Um, so is he 137 years old at his, at his death? So I agree that there's one start date and uh, one end date, but the start date of the 490 years must be after the end of the 70-year period. So you mentioned that the, the, um, the prophecy about Jerusalem being restored. Yes, there are many prophecies about the people of Israel, um, Ezekiel 36, being brought back, being scattered, being brought back, being scattered, being brought back. But the only one that gives you a time, i.e. the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, is that prophecy in Luke. Now, we haven't got time to go into when is the uh, times of the Gentiles, when did it start, when does it finish? But there are three references in the New Testament to the start of the time of the Gentiles and the uh, time of the Gentiles being fulfilled. So this prophecy is adding further detail to those Old Testament prophecies about Jews being scattered and then brought back. You didn't address those. It, it seems that you spent a lot of time um, talking about things you disagree with. And yet, if we look at the, the, the temple idea, the, if you're expecting one fulfillment... And the uh, New Testament says that actually it wasn't the uh, temple that was destroyed at that time, but Christ putting his body um, to death. Then doesn't that fulfill John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. If John the Baptist is calling him the Lamb of God, and in the Old Testament if you committed a sin, it was the death of the Lamb that forgave your sins, can you not see that... Um, that link between the symbolism of the Old Testament rituals and Christ's life. You also mentioned that um, there are prophecies about what the Messiah would do and it's as if you don't seem to recognize some of these happen after there is a complete restoration of God's kingdom. So there are prophecies prior to the complete restoration and then after the destruction of the wicked then you have Entire harmony. Those are two different phases. It's as if you're saying that everything comes to pass on one day and then the, the new phase starts. So there are different prophecies for different times. And you, you mentioned commas uh, and semicolons. I'm not defending the King James translators. 
But as far as I'm aware, are there commas and semicolons in Hebrew? Are there commas and semicolons in Hebrew? Okay, let me quickly show you something then. Bible. I'll just go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1. So, the original Hebrew was, oh, you can't see that, so let me drag it onto the screen. The original Hebrew was not that which came out of Babylon. It was, in fact, pictographic. So, I can't see any commas or semicolons there. The original Hebrew, the pictographic Hebrew, was in fact universal, not spoken. In that pictures paint a thousand words, the original Hebrew scriptures were pictures. Where are the commas and the semicolons? They will have come from the scholars who, in order to try to uh, say how to pronounce the words in Babylon, came up with the uh, additional characters but the Hebrew that Moses spoke was pictographic. I would like to see the semicolons and commas that Moses used in the pictographic Hebrew. You asked what happened in the middle of the last week. So the last week began with the anointing of the Messiah at the baptism that Jesus received uh, by John the Baptist. The middle of the week was his death and resurrection. And then, approximately three and a half years later, Stephen was stoned. In effect, it's the, um, some of the Jews rejecting the uh, testimony of, of Stephen that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Messiah. You mentioned the 66 AD and then you said that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. That doesn't sound like a prophecy of the Bible. When a, a Bible prophecy is made, it is fulfilled to the year, not four years later. So I'm really struggling to understand how your um, 70 weeks are fulfilled in 66, and yet the temple is destroyed four years later. As I've already said, I don't endorse changes to the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, but how are we to study the Bible? Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 10, we are to read here a little, here a little, there a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. If we want to understand anything, we take every reference in the Bible on that topic, put them together, they are pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. You don't just make a decision on a single verse. So we should follow um, Isaiah's advice and then the comma and semicolon here and there, when put in the entire picture of all the verses, makes complete sense. So, yes, what the King James translators did in, in Hebrews chapter 8 is wrong, but when you put all those texts together about the new covenant uh, from Jeremiah, from um, uh, Romans, as we looked at Romans chapter 2, we looked at uh, earlier, then we get the full picture. That new covenant... Is it going to be fulfilled at some point in the future? Or are people responding to the Holy Spirit as they did in Moses' time? Uh, Moses said, you know, I wish that all God's um, people were filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit that Christ said he would send when he returned to heaven has been seen around the world. There are miracles that take place, insights into Scripture that take place through the influence of the Holy Spirit. So... Actually, you, you went on to explain uh, Emmanuel, so I did ask why focus on young woman in Isaiah 7.14. But the sense in which Matthew uses Emmanuel is no different to the way that you use it of the, of the, of the king. So someone who is living, it's not saying that um, it is God who is living, but the character of God is being um, displayed in the life of Jesus Christ. And again, I'll, I'll ask, Please criticize something you've seen Jesus do or say so that I can understand what the, what the problem is with him. 
If he is the Messiah and he's portraying the ways of God and there are many people, even the Sikhs, who do charity work. Sikhs are 2% of the population of India. 67% of all charitable giving in India is done by the Sikhs. Why are they doing such um, charitable things? Why are Christians supposed to love one another? Yes, there are sects that kill. But the majority of Christians aren't like that. They're patterning their lives on Jesus Christ. Is that something that's bad and terrible? So, this is my uh, last... Okay, um, so if, if the Jews have, have been the anointed ones who have taken the message to the world, how many Gentile men have ever become Jews? And by that I'm looking at the thing that uh, has to take place surgically... Uh, for them to convert. Now, isn't the real essence of this Judaism conversion is how many have had a circumcised heart? Isn't that what God wants from his people, to have circumcised hearts, men and women, young and old, that we live in harmony with his um, principles? You know, Emmanuel was one of the messages. Emmanuel is the message of um, God to primarily the Jews. The name Yeshua, Jesus, Saviour, is primarily to non-Jews. But it's supposed to unite us. He said at the Last Supper, it is finished. I finished the work which you gave me to do, uh, he said in John 17 verse 3. So he, he showed us how to live, Emmanuel, live as God would want us to live. Live uh, loving each other, forgiving each other, being kind to each other. And he also said it's finished when he's on the cross because he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and he died to save us all. So, yeah, I, th I think that, that will do. So, uh, thank you all very much. I think I have a, a better understanding of how a Mosquito must feel in a nudist colony. <laughs> he must be saying to himself, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean that in any way disparaging about Carlton. He's a very fine gentleman. I've enjoyed his company and I'm enriched by it. We spent a lot of time speaking together. Nothing that I say, God forbid, should be in any way construed to characterize Carlton in, in a way other than he's a man who seeks after Hashem. And it is my prayer for you, that you come to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You will embrace the Jewish faith and you will reject Christianity. Amen. conceded that in fact so many so many hundreds of millions have been murdered by the church by the followers of Jesus not just Jews this is true not every victim of the church was a Jew but every Jew was a victim Scripture tells us what the Messiah is supposed to do, how he would change the world. I will cut off the chariots of Ephraim and the horses of war from Yushalayim. And what will happen? And he will speak peace unto the nations. And his rule will be from one end of the sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. And that did not happen. It was a very antithesis of what occurred. Carlton had mentioned in his presentation, that Jesus is the sin sacrifice, the Passover lamb. You'll find that, in fact, not in Matthew, not in Mark, not in Luke. You'll, in fact, find that in John, it's unique to John, John of the Gospels, it's John chapter 1, verse 29, and it was quoted in verse 36 as well. But the Passover lamb is not a sin sacrifice. It was a sacrifice bought for righteousness. Where does it say in Scripture, in Exodus chapter 12, that the Passover lamb was brought for sin? It was the opposite. Why was a Passover sacrifice brought? Now, there were offerings for sin, but the Passover sacrifice was not for sin. 
The lamb was treated, was characterized, was worshipped among the Egyptians as a god. And harming a lamb, would have found, you would have been dead if you would have harmed a lamb. In fact, when Pharaoh asked Moses in Exodus chapter 8, verse 25 and 26, why do you have to go out into the wilderness to bring your offerings? Bring them here, here in Egypt. Why do you have to go anywhere? And Moshe, all of us, Moses, our teacher, said, because if we do that, you're going to kill us. You're going to stone us right here. And therefore, the Jewish people were faced with a dilemma. They could see the Egyptian armies around them. They would have put them to death for killing the lamb, their god. And they were ordered to take the lamb and to kill it, to slaughter it, and put the blood on the outside of the door so everyone could see it was a test of faith. Would you fear the God of Israel more than the armies of the Egyptians that you could see? Or would you fear the Egyptians? Those who are virtuous, those who are willing to publicly display their devotion to Hashem, and that they didn't fear the Egyptians, those are the ones who were saved. It wasn't a sin offering. There's no mention of this. This is an idea that would, in fact, we could find it in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, we could find it in John. This is an idea that's uniquely Christian. It's not found in the Jewish scriptures. But we do find in the Jewish scriptures that the Mashiach is supposed to bring peace to the world. There will be a complete transformation of the world. We find, we find none of that in the Christian Bible. I want to speak a moment about the colons and commas. The text in Daniel chapter 9, the angel Gabriel is speaking, and he is responding to a prayer of Daniel. The text specifically says, The Seid of Ahaskel min Maitadava, that no one understand from the going forth of the word, Lahashiv the Libna Yishlayim, Ad Mashiach Nagid, until an anointed prince, that's Cyrus, Shvuim Shiva, seven weeks, period. Now he said, Khan said, well, we don't have an ancient Hebrew, we don't have commas. But how do you say 69 in Hebrew? Nobody says 69, seven weeks, and then 70, then 62 weeks. No one speaks that way. It's after the 62 weeks that in fact that an anointed one is cut off. That means in what universe is the word, the number 69 conveyed by 7, 60, and 2? That's the point. It's after the seven weeks, after the full period from the destruction of the first temple until Cyrus emerges, past a half a century, have to pass by. And then it continues on until the destruction of the temple, which is initiated in the half a week that we find in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and verse 27. So of course we don't in the Hebrew, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, which long predate the Mesoratic text, of course we don't find commas and semicolons. Of course we don't. But we understand that when the text says it'll be seven weeks, that's a stop. And then it says in 62 weeks, it'll be rebuilt, street and moat. In what language do you say 69 by saying 7, 2, and 60? It doesn't exist. Whether it's in French, it'll be 69. Whether it'll be in German, 9 and 60. In what language do you express 69? by saying of 7, 2, and 60. It doesn't exist. As I said, the King James in 1611 had the semicolon there, because it was obvious. Moreover, if we were dealing with one anointed one, then why would verse 26 say, and after the 62 weeks? It would say after the 69 weeks. It would say after the 7, 60, and 2 weeks. We see explicitly from the text that there's a stop. We see explicitly there are two anointed ones, one who comes after Cyrus, and one who is removed, an anointed priest that's removed, and therefore the sacrifices come to an end. We know exactly when that occurred. Therefore, we ask ourselves, where is this passage that describes the coming of Messiah or a killing of Messiah? We have no such verse. We talk about the church, that that brought light to the world. I can't imagine an institution that has diminished from the light of the world. What is the role of the Jewish people? Why are we here? To be lawyers and doctors and businessmen? That's not why we're here. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. 
my servant whom I have chosen. What is the purpose of why are we here? So that you should know, Vaseda, Vasaminuli, and you should believe in me. And you should understand that there was no God formed before me, and there will be no God after me. Next verse, Anoichi, I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no other Savior. But, as it tells us in Isaiah chapter 40, in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, think about earlier times. There is no one else besides me. There is nothing else, nothing, nothing before me, nothing, nothing after me. That's what the scripture says. And the church teaches that there is a man who could become God. Then we have to run away from that because scripture says that God cannot be a man. That cannot happen. And therefore, I, I hope, I pray that we are, we, are, we are certainly living in a unique time. It is my hope that through the spreading of the light to the world, that will be Zeichel, we merit to see the coming of the true Mashiach, Bimher Biyameinu, quickly in our time. Thank you.